All right. Is this one on? Is this good? Can everyone hear me? Hello, hello. Can, can you hear me? Are you sure? Oh. How many people stayed from the last panel? Oh, look at you guys. You're awesome. I told you I'd promise not to talk as much. I lied. Okay. <laughs> that was mine. <clears throat> so um, we just went through a bit of the, the history. OK, actually, I'm sorry. Before I start, because I just got yelled at. <clears throat> Please turn off your cell phones and or pagers if you are still rocking a pager. <laughs> <laughs> we are live webcasting, so please go to the microphones in the aisles when the Q&A session starts. Um, at the end of this program, we, you must take everything and exit the auditorium. If you want to get in for uh, Nolan's uh, talk, you have to actually go upstairs and re-queue. So. Sorry, but that's the way we're going to have to run it. And with that, we're going to jump right into it. So I'm very pleased to have another fine set of panelists with us today to talk about the future of video games. So directly to my, well, I should say again for those who haven't, uh, for those who aren't here, my name is Chris Melisinos. I'm the curator for the Art of Video Games exhibition at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Thank you. And we have a wonderful panel for you. Directly to my left is Mark Delora. I've known Mark, gosh, it's going on 12 <laughs> years now? Awful long 13 time. years. Uh, Mark has been a senior technologist in the games industry for uh, quite some time. He's had a variety of roles at Google, Nintendo, Sony, Ubisoft, and THQ. He also served as the editor-in-chief of Game Developer Magazine, back where I met Mark. So, Mr. Mark Delora. Directly to his left in the most awesome jacket you will ever see, <laughs> and you are easy to find uh, Mr. Barnett at any trade show wearing this. <laughs> Paul is the Senior Creative Director for Bioware Mythic. He developed AOL's first interactive game, Legends of Terrace, and is best known for games workshops Warhammer Fantasy Battle Universe. Mr. Paul Barnett. <laughs> Next we have Ken Levine, originally a screenwriter and playwright. He has designed games like Looking Glass's Thief, The Dark Project, and System Shock 2, which is quite frightening, <laughs> and served as a project director of Bioshock for the PC and Xbox 360. <laughs> and we have with us Kelly Santiago, who is the co-founder and current president of that game company was named as one of Kotaku's most influential women in games in 2010, and is a partner in Indie Fund, which helps indie developers reach and maintain financial independence. Woo. Kelly yeah. Santiago. Yeah. All right, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> so the panel that we, that we just had before was um, really talking about the evolution of games um, starting at the beginning, and some of the problems that earliest game developers had, um, how to go in and convey story, how to convey you know, tension ideas through very minimalist technologies, and uh, how still you're able to create inspired works and art that comes out of these things, even with technological limitations. Uh, for this panel, we want to talk about the future of games. You know, with technology becoming less and less of a barrier for describing worlds, for describing art, um, how are we going to harness these mediums moving forward, this technology base moving forward to create new experiences? So with that, um, I'd like to start by talking to Kelly okay. ab about um, <laughs> the idea behind one of the games that uh, that game company did, which was Flow. Okay. And uh, if you could talk to us. <laughs> Thank you. Just, if you can applaud. <laughs> <laughs> You can applaud. Um, and the reason I want to start with this is it's a game that when I first experienced it was uh, 
foreign yet familiar to me. Mm. And it wasn't until I actually started engaging with it that I better understood what was underneath. Can you talk to us a bit about how the game came about and its intent? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny because you, know, you get that question of like, how you guys make such innovative games. How do you make innovative games? And we're like, well, flow is like snake, so it's not so. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, we just take old ideas um, and remix them, essentially, which is what is the creative process. Um, so flow started as part of the MFA thesis project by my business partner, Genova Chen. And his work was to apply um, the psychological theory of flow um, uh, developed by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. It's a great book on flow theory and sort of the, how we become, um, as humans, just the, the sense of fun and engaged in, in, our, in any given activity. And uh, after doing this research and talking with various uh, people in different fields on this state, um, many of them would describe it as a feeling of like, flowing through water. When you're in that state, you sort of lose track of time because you're just so engaged. Uh, it came as a result of the response to our previous student project called Cloud. And Cloud was a game um, where we were really trying to take this idea of making a game about a subject that we felt hadn't been covered in the video game marketplace and which we thought could appeal to a wide variety of people regardless of their gamer or non-gamer status. Um, which was the feeling of what it, what it feels like to be a kid and daydream and while you're looking at the clouds. And so um, in the game, you play as this boy who's trapped in a hospital who daydreams he can fly through the clouds. And it's a really simple game. Um, but what we found is that it did attract people who wouldn't normally be downloading uh, games on, through their computers. Um, but the controls were so hard, and it sort of still relied on some um, I, some ideas of what uh, playing a game meant. Um, so Chernova wanted to take this flow theory and apply it to a game to sort of create an experience that was also from a technological and interactive perspective accessible to a wide variety of people. And so in flow, it's a really simple game where you play as this abstract aquatic organism and you eat. That's your action. And through eating, you determine your experience as a player. You can uh, eat these red foods that take you down to harder, more complex levels. You can eat blue foods that keep you sort of at a higher, more simpler level. And you can engage in combat with other creatures through eating them. Or you can just experience it and you know, keep swimming all the way down and just sort of see the sights in the game. So, so that's where the idea of flow came from. Thank you. Ken, you know, you and I uh, spoke uh, very briefly before we started the panel here, and one of the things I was describing to you is about how mechanics um, tend to stay the same. They tend to persist over time. You know, Kelly describing flow as really snake, right, which is yeah. a very rudimentary sort of game, one that actually has roots all the way back in snafu on the Intellivision. Mr. Mm -hmm. Keith Robinson sitting right here in the front. <laughs> Robinson sitting right here in the front. Um, in the games that you create, your worlds tend to be very expansive, um, tend to have a lot of uh, very deep story and reflection, social reflection within them. But at the root, there are some base mechanics that are always true. Can you talk about how you appropriate those mechanics into the bigger stories that you try to tell? Yeah, I mean, look, there's a, there's a basic weirdness about making first-person shooters because when well, first-person shooters or third-person games like Uncharted, you're essentially telling the story. Like, if, if I had killed like 500 people, there's no, I would not be known as Ken Levine, the, the crazy archaeologist, or Ken Levine, the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the genetically modified dude. I'd be known as Ken Levine, the insane mass killer. <laughs> and, and, and that's, so we sort of start with this weird proposition. I mean, Kelly's games are really interesting because they sort of live by their own rules. And she est they establish a world, and there's an, abs there's an abstractness which allows um, so, uh, not to have to explain away some of these notions. And I think there's a degree of, of, of math that people do in their heads when they play you know, certain games and when they watch movies. You know, the same, it's no different than Indiana Jones. He's not really an archaeologist. He's, he's a psychopath. You know? <laughs> um, and um, I, I think, but the audience is willing to suspend their disbelief and do some degree of math where they say, well, maybe it's not really killing 6,000 people. Maybe it's killing one or two. And that's OK, because there's a reason. Um, <laughs> And so, but there's, a, there's an important component of what makes a game, and that's, there is generally a skill component. 
And lots of games have different ways of approaching that. Kelly's games ha have a certain way, Mark's games have a different way, pa Paul's games have a different way, Mark's games have a different way, and um, you know, we have, we have a certain way. And the reason I've sort of ended up in first person shooters is you know, the first person experience is really a nice experience for exploring worlds. It's a nice vehicle. And I'm not, I don't like, I'm not a big fan of like puzzle, making puzzles. I don't know how to make a lot of puzzles. It's not really my thing. So, you know, it sort of leaves killing people. Um, and, um, you know, which is this experience you do along with what, you know, exploring the world and learning about, whether it's, um, you know, Elizabeth and Booker and Bioshock Infinite or Andrew Ryan and, and Bioshock One. It's, and look, and I'm, I'm not looking down on shooting in games. I, I am, I'm an old school gamer. I love twitching. I love twitch mechanics. I love shooting. I love all that stuff. Um, and I'm not, you know, I don't think anybody's going to look at my games and say, you know, Ken Levine and his company are on the forefront of, you know, new abstract game design components. That's not, that's not me. But a lot of it is so we can create these worlds and tell these stories, but, you know, what's blocking you from moving forward? A game like Heavy Rain deals with that problem by coming up with sort of puzzly experiences. And, but those are as abstract, as weird as, as mass murdering in their own way, because they are, re people don't really encounter those experiences in real life on a regular basis. But the audience makes allowances. So it really is, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. But well, well, okay. <laughs> I'm defending my own psychopath. No, no problem. <laughs> so so here, here's what I would ask you. So in the context of a game like Bioshock, you're still able to have this experience that you as the, the designer, right, the author of this experience wants to have. But within the gameplay framework, you present the player with choices that they have to figure out where their moral line lies, right? In terms of what are they going to attack within the game? What are they going to preserve? Where do they stand in terms of uh, aggression or, or pacifism? And so your games, while ultimately you have to complete certain tasks to reach ultimate goals, you provide this, um, this pull of tension between it. Can you talk a bit about engaging the player and having them as part of the experience by constantly testing kind of their moral position? You know, I think the moral stuff, and I think, I think um, the Bioware guys are, you know, far advanced over, you know, us in terms of the, the, the range of, of, moral, of moral choices. And, 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 you know, Bioshock was rather simple, you know. It was, it was, it, it was set, the game was set in a moral context, in a moral milieu, you know, of this whole milieu, um, of, of, this, of this world, you know, with objectivism and notions of commerce and where does commerce begin and where does commerce end and what's appropriate for that. But the actual choice was very simple. It was like, the, you know, what do you do with this little girl? And, um, and I think that worked strictly because it was tied so much into the world. But it was, it, was, it was very, very simple in a lot of ways. And most of it was quite visceral. You know, it didn't work until, like originally in the game, the, the creatures, there were no little sisters. There were these sort of sea slug, large sea slugs that big daddies were protecting. And, and it was terrible because you didn't, there was no empathy with the sea slug. So when you killed it, you're like, yeah, I just you know, killed a sea slug, whatever. Um, <laughs> but the reason Little Girls came about is because in order for that decision to be meaningful, in order to engage in the larger story of you know, Andrew Ryan's view of com commerce at all costs, um, and essentially you were making that decision about commerce at all costs, we had to, make it, we had to create empathy between the player and the thing that they were making their decision about. And I think that's, that's where that fell out of. And I think it was effective primarily because we were able to create empathy with little sisters. Um, but that, that took a while to sort of get to that point and figure that out. Mm -hmm. Paul, <laughs> with your fancy jacket. Do I have jacket. to follow that? <laughs> <laughs> you do. You have to follow that. Maybe you can talk to us a bit about um, some of the work that you're currently doing at Mythic and how story is playing into the work that you're doing. Or no. I'm sorry, EA Mythic, oh, excuse me. No. Bioware Mythic. No, excuse me. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> I would love uh, you to do no, that. No, I'm not going to do that. I'll tell you why. Because when you rung me up and you said, come and talk about the future of computer games, I went and wrote loads of stuff down about future computer games. And I'm gonna Actually, I have a better question for you. I have a better I, question. I got it in hey, there. Hey, Paul, you know, I have ideas. I've heard <laughs> about these ideas. Like there you go. That's a much better age. plan. <laughs> Perhaps you could elaborate on what this this thing you keep bringing up about your idea of the golden age is. Oh, that's good. That's much better. I, I just don't want to talk about... <laughs> I, I, in all honesty, I just don't want to talk about product. I think future computer games is a really interesting question. So I'd love, love to actually talk about it. So I did think about it. I came up with a couple of things. Um, I'd love this panel to happen in the future and have more diversity. 
Um, it's all right having pasty-faced white guys and one lady, but you know, <laughs> a bit more diversity would help. That would be a pretty good future. Um, I think we should have a future for computer games. That would be quite awesome as well. Um, and then I thought about it, and I brought about everything about the future is going to come from the past. The people who are going to make the games in the future are the people who are playing the games now. And it's the game players today who are going to grow up and go, I'm now going to make games. They're going to be great. Which led me to one of the things I have, which I talk to people when they want, to, want a job. I talk about golden ages. And I talk about how every gamer I've met, and by that I mean gamer, not a business, but every gamer I've ever met has a golden age. They have a period that they start becoming obsessed with games, and then they play them, and then something happens. And I think it's to do when they have to, you know, they stop being, they have to pay bills. And, and stuff like, all that crap that your parents do. Once that, stop, that starts, they stop their golden age. My golden age, uh, through movies, Empire Strikes Back, through uh, to Say Anything by John Cusack. And within that period, I'm, I'm every game you could possibly want to play. I played the hell out of it. Every platform, everything. And what's interesting about my, my golden age is it's where I learned my prejudices about what games I like and I don't like. Hate simulators. They were all crap during my period. Um, love certain types of games. Don't like other types of games. Sometimes because they're on the wrong platform, I just never got to play them. So I just don't have a Super Nintendo love in. It, never, it was never in England. So I just never played it. Um, that period defines my understanding of games. And it defines it so strongly, like so strongly, that now when I'm in a position to make games, it colors my view. What's also interesting about my golden age is every game before it, I can intellectually appreciate, but I don't actually give a crap about. <laughs> which was drawn home to me when I went upstairs to the art of video games, which, by the way, congratulations with that. It must be art with a hard-bound book. <laughs> That's <laughs> settled. Um, You're welcome. It, it, no, it's good, good book. Uh, everything that isn't in my golden age, I went, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. And everything outside, everything after my golden age, I was like, yeah, I can appreciate it, I suppose. But, and then I noticed you, like, you don't have a spectrum. It's what I played when I was a little kid. Specky mm -hmm. fan, so I didn't have that. So what's interesting about golden age is the following. Every single person has a golden age, and every single person's golden age is the best golden age they could possibly have had. It is no one's fault that the first Final Fantasy they got was 11. It's not their fault. <laughs> as, much, oh. as much as I don't agree with that, it's not their fault. That's the one they got. And for them, it's great. It's, you know, it's not their fault. They don't know why, where Doom came from, and they haven't played certain games. So when you meet people who are trying to get games made, this golden age that people are going through is going to be their golden age, and it's going to be the thing that the game players of today are going to use to make the games of tomorrow. And where I draw a lot of hope for the future is the current golden age is pretty bloody good. <laughs> it's a phenomenal golden age. Like, Craig, it's unbelievable. I can't appreciate it. I'm too old. But, <laughs> but my little boy, Callum, he's 13 in England. He's 13 all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, I swear to you, I swear to you, I can see him at the age of 40 going, I want to make this game. It's like Minecraft. And I can hear people going, the stupid thing with squares that looks ugly. No, you don't understand. It's formative. It's really, really important. It matters. It looks really lame. You play it on a screen. Uh. And it's, it's, like, it's going to be the games he's going to make. So I think Future Computer Games is awesome. Hmm. So it's interesting. <laughs> that is actually. <laughs> No, no, Xavier clapping, he has more. Um, <laughs> so what I find really interesting, you talk about the golden age thing, you know, well, like I said, I started programming on VIC-20, right? 3,192 bytes of available space in which to craft a game. And I remember taking this, this system out of, you know, storage and connecting it to a 52-inch screen television, and the resolution was 20 by 23 characters. And I had my oldest daughter in the room, and I said, this is called a cassette. And what we do is we used to store games on this. So I want you to put this in here and type load and press play. And then we'll go get a drink and <laughs> a snack. And we'll come back in. And we'll, it was all done. And the cursor is blinking. I said, now type run. And she hit run. And up came this horribly janky uh, Pac-Man clone that I typed in from Compute Gazette. Oh, yeah. 
And instantly, I was back in that golden age. And I said, oh my goodness, look at how beautiful this is. And so she goes, well, could you get on the internet with that? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, honey, when I was your age, the internet didn't. Oh, that must have been so boring. <laughs> <laughs> kind of gets up and walks out. But, it, you know, so we do have the golden age through which we kind of view a time where we have this period of exploration. And we're, we're framing the decisions we're making about the world, the observations that we make about our world in that way. But to the point that Ken and I first started discussing, you brought up, the same mechanics seem to persist over time. They persist from golden age to golden age. Now, Mark, you've worked on a wide variety of platforms, going all the way back to looking at uh, virtual reality simulation in the early 90s mm -hmm. to working on multiple platforms at Nintendo. Is it, do we get locked into this golden age because we can't see anything beyond what was important to us at that moment in time, even though the same mechanics, the same choices we make persist? Can you give some thought about you've, how you've seen the evolution of kind of segmentation across generations? In yeah, I'm it. I get ex I sort of exasperated by the concepts of golden age because I, I see people like my parents listening to the Golden Oldies channel, and then I realize that now there's Golden Oldies channels with the music from my era. The 80s. From the 80s. Right. And I'm like, that's Kaja Goo Goo. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I, think, um, I think it is completely natural and normal that everybody has these golden ages. I think you really hit on something there. Um, probably most likely because it's formative years, people haven't heard things, they're paying more attention to the music, it seems to relate to the experiences they're going through as an adolescent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I actually think that it's incumbent upon us to try to break that crap down. Sorry, I'm going to. He told me not to curse, but I'm not very good at that, so I apologize for <laughs> um, That's who I am. Um, yeah, when I see myself falling into a golden age, it's a trap, and I hate it, because, uh, as an example, I'm, I'm a jazz fan, and jazz had a golden age. It was in the 40s and 50s. I grew up with it in the 80s and early 90s, and I was listening to all the music from the 40s and 50s. If you listen to modern jazz on the radio today, it's the same songs as the 40s and 50s. A lot, of a lot of times, the exact same songs. And there's some real comfort in that. You know, I think it's the same thing with video games. I go back, I pull out my 2600, I play these games, and I'm like, oh, you know, like Compute Gazette and all this. I have the exact same reaction. But then I go play one of games like Flow or Flower or Eco. I haven't played Journey yet. It's coming <laughs> soon. I um, can't wait. And these, you, these you didn't get in the beta? I did, actually. No, I did, but I only played it. For, I didn't want to spoil it, so I only played it for like 10 minutes. <laughs> it's way better now. <laughs> uh, the games that break my mentality of what a game should be, those are the games I really get excited about. And, and kind of yeah. going back to what you were saying, Paul, about there's like four white people on stage, five white people on stage. Mm -hmm. Can't count today. Um, I, one of the things in the future of video games that I get really excited about is when I meet people from other cultures. Like, um, I think it was just last Sunday, somebody walked up to me. He's like, I really want to talk to you about video games in South Africa because we have a really tiny community and we're trying to do stuff that these are games that reflect our culture and nobody understands our culture outside of the people in South Africa. But wouldn't mm -hmm. it be awesome if I could tell you what it was like to grow up as a kid in South Africa? And me, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. That would be awesome. I want to hear those games. The problem is getting his voice out is really hard. Mm -hmm. Clearly, that's going to improve over time. The iPhone, I think, has been something that's helped break down barriers now that we can distribute easily. But it's, it's still a hard challenge. And these guys have, around the world, you find that the markets are smaller for video games. And so the voices are quieter. So I think it's like for all us pioneers up here, veterans, whatever, um, one of the things that I would like to challenge us all to do is to reach out into communities you don't expect games to come from and really pull those out and get them shared with the, the broader community. Yeah. <laughs> really good point. With, with technology at the disposal of basically anybody who wants to develop an idea, a thought, uh, you know, a story within this medium, I mean, there's never been a greater point in history where you, people have had access to tools, access to technology, access to reach. Um, and so we've kind of experienced this um, hyper-evolution of games, whereas you know, Don was explaining in the prior panel, just as we kind of come to grips with one technology platform and you finally figured out how to wring out of it what you need, mm -hmm. the next one has come along and we've kind of moved mm -hmm. this away. Technology seems, again, we've kind of 
hit this point of expanse where, well, I now I, you know, I don't have to work so hard to be photorealistic. I can kind of already get there. So now I can start limiting myself as an artist, as a storyteller, to pull back from that, to create more abstract notions of these things. How do you see, and this is open to anyone that wants to start discussing this, how do you see the access to tools mm. and the access to uh, you know, this broad base of technology, how do you feel it's going to start changing the way game developers look at crafting experiences, not only for themselves, but for you know, a much broader audience? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's really interesting right now with especially the, the rise of um, sort of the, the rebirth of 2D gaming through um, sort of the browser, uh, in-browser technology and also the app stores and mobile platforms. Um, I kind of, uh, I don't know about this theory of the golden age, actually. It kind of bothered me. <laughs> like, I actually don't think, um, uh, I, I think, it, I guess what, what I'm getting to is like that the, the sort of um, allowance that current technology has in sort of bringing us back to um, simplistic game designs and really uh, giving tools to those artists that um, maybe did grow up with old, older 2D games and now have the opportunity to really easily access that technology and sort of express themselves through it. I think it shows pretty much that the golden age, you know, our golden age or whatever, um, wasn't really so golden. Because there's nothing from a design perspective that wasn't capable then in 2D that somehow we magically have now. It's just there wasn't a whole lot of um, critical and cultural discourse around games as a medium, you know, and what, what those things are. Um, I think also a lot of games of that period were drawn from the thinking that made the arcade, which was get the quarter, get the quarter, get the quarter. And so they didn't, they couldn't breathe in the same way once, it took a while even for us make, as game makers to move away from the, the punishing the player way of thinking. The games were super, super hard and they weren't designed to be experienced, they were designed to, to sort of crush your soul. And, <laughs> yeah, um, take your money. And take your, mo and take your money, but that's that, because there was an imperative there. And, but it's amazing how games, and there's a lot of things that just because of the nature of the formation of games define games. A, that all games for the longest time were about you know fighting dragons or killing aliens because of the little weird nerds like me who were making it. That was the thing that that they were interested in. And now you have as as the sort of the, the you know the um, the audio, the spate of developers grow. You have people like Kelly and Chernobyl coming along with a different set of interests. You know, mm -hmm. a book about flow, right? And, and therefore, they don't have, and, and games sort of became this thing about, well, that's all about dragons, and that's all about aliens. But that's a function of how it started, in the same way the quarter munching was a function of how it started. And it's hard to sort of move away from that. OK, so to that point, um, with the access to these platforms to tell stories, how do you feel video games will change in terms of the type of stories we want to tell? Do you think we're already telling? the breadth of stories that can be told through the medium of games? I mean, wh what do you think is going to help propel that forward? I don't know where games are going to be tomorrow. I mean, things are changing <laughs> so fast. Right. And I think that all you can do as a game developer is sort of be open to change and roll with it, rather than sort of trying to predict too far. Because you know, five years ago, you held up an iPhone to somebody, or you held up a Facebook you know, screen to somebody, or you held up Kickstarter to somebody. You know, things change every month. You know, that Kickstarter thing is going to be very powerful. Yeah. And I don't know if it's going to exist in the current form it is right now, or it's going to, be, but, or it's going to evolve into something else. You know, but this notion of a democratized patronage is incredibly powerful. Oh, excuse me. That was, about a, that was a month ago. And um, so things are changing all the time. And I, I think it is, it's a fun exercise, but I think at the end of the day, it's sort of a fruitless exercise. We always do that. What you can train yourself to do is, is not reject it. You know, it's, you know, all music isn't like, you know, you know this is a golden age argument as well. Uh, for, well, it's strange, because I, I, like you guys, I grew up in the 80s too, and that's not my golden age, because the music was fucking, it was, excuse me, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, One of us is gonna do that eventually. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, no, but it's what you get access to. I think the, the golden age is what you get access to. There was games available, but I never got to see them, so I don't care. I played the ones I could get hold of. What's weird about my golden age is I have to understand everyone else's is legitimate. 
And it's very hard because your instinct is to go, no, mine's best. See, but and I, you go, well, everyone's good. But I don't feel that way about the games I grew up with, I, I guess. I mean, that's what like propelled me to make Love the Manic games Miner. that I do. I don't know. I, I was a gamer you know, ever since I was little, but it was really hard for me. I mean, unless I'm still in my golden age, maybe, but <laughs> it was really hard for me until really the last few years to answer that question of what's your favorite game of all time. Like, I know the games I've spent time on, but I don't know, the ones that like, grabbed me emotionally and have moved me. I mean, those really have just happened the last few years. I think, you know, it's interesting. I think golden age can change too. You know, I had the same, you know, set of, you know, growth experiences you guys did. We all grew up with the same platforms and everything. But a new golden age for me is now I play games with my kids. Mm -hmm. And so the games that I'm choosing to play and the reward that comes out of that gameplay is as valuable, if not more so, than what I remember. I mean, you know, we tend to look back with very fond memories about very, you know, key critical critical things in our past. And I completely agree with you. We look back with that resonance of, well, of course, my experience with my Big Twenty is better than yours with your Big Twenty because clearly yours was inferior. <laughs> right. well, that, that's, um, I call that game track, like like the soundtrack of your life. Hold on a minute. You have something called game track? I do. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, perhaps you could describe that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's because it's the reason I bring up the game, but by the way, the golden age, I bring it up in interviews because I've got to get snap them out of it because I want them to be created now. I don't want them to try and make their past. Game track was when I realized that I don't give a crap about music that much, but if you put on a certain loading screen sound or a certain screen or a certain box, I instantly teleport back to wherever I was in my life when that happened. And I remember where I was sitting, what I was doing, what the smells were, what my mother was, what the wallpaper looked like. It's the strangest thing. I have a very strong, like, life memory. And so these games, when I'm up there at the, the exhibit, every time I see a game that's on my game track, I go, ooh. And so I think mm -hmm. that as game makers, one of the things to aim for is to try and make a game worthy of going on someone's game track. And for some people, those games are just because they got it for Christmas and they liked it and they had time. But, but imagine actually setting out, I think, Mass Effect, one, two, and three together is a generational game track game. I think there are groups of people who will remember. I remember that. I remember playing one, two, three, getting to the end. <laughs> <laughs> no, do. Um, but, but one of the other things I think is fascinating about the future of games, I've identified two things that I think are really interesting. First, technology went backwards. One of the few times it's ever happened. Uh, up until then, games were always about higher fidelity, more triangles, more mm -hmm. polygons, more, 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 more. And all of a sudden, we slipped backwards, be it trying to make it work on a phone or trying to make it work in a browser, trying to get a download time. And that's, that that's, limitation that's not, that, that's was normal. fabulous. That's normal, though. That's, we, we started off with arcade games. We jumped back to home consoles. We went forward to home consoles, and we yeah. jumped back to handhelds, and we went forward to handhelds, and now we're jumping back to yeah. phones. Uh, like, but, what's the next thing going to be? That's uh, been the big, bit, the big breakthrough this time cycling, around. Though. Oh, well, th you're older than me. I like no. that. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that. But the other thing that's happened along with that is a breadth of the people who play games. You identify say to someone, are you a gamer? And they'll go, yes or no. If you're a gamer, how many hours do you play games a week? Well, he has done a lot of research. It's about 19. Are you not a gamer? No, absolutely not. I do not identify. But you've got access to things on your phone and that. Yeah, how many hours do you do? 12 hours a mm -hmm. week. And you go, well, you're a gamer then. Mm -hmm. And then you get, what is the average gamer age? It's really high now. And so you've got this weird thing of, you know, games have become everywhere. It's just, for the hardcore people, it's the wrong games. <laughs> <laughs> not supposed oh, to be playing oh. Facebook games. It's the wrong type of games. We're all supposed to be playing. Big console games. <laughs> and so there's that, more people playing. That's really common. I think a lot of, I get questions all the time like, well, do you think games should be this or do you think games should be that? And I think that's such a sad question. You know, I think games should be whatever floats anybody's boat. Um, and I, I read that a lot. A lot, especially a lot of developers um, get incensed when people are working in a different space. And, you know, especially, on, I think on the indie side, especially because I think they feel really passionate that games should never, you know, like there's a lot of people who say games shouldn't, like World of Warcraft is evil because. It's this gambling mechanic, and yeah, it is this gambling mechanic. So what? It's fun, you know. And and you should make the game you want to make, and you should make the game you should make, and you should make the game you want to make. It's all, you know. I think it, I think it's all good. I'm not, I'm not sure where that kind of 
that kind of snobbery comes from. Yeah. And, and it's the changing of gaming. There was lean-in gaming on PC, mm -hmm. lean-back gaming on consoles, and then there's this like curl-up gaming on your sort of thing. <laughs> 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 so like, really, it's really quite interesting. And the other thing I do when people come for interviews, I talk to them, is I point out that a, a lot of games, HD games, high-definition high games, they're there to reassure and reflect, whereas the indie space is there to like challenge and champion. And, and you just got to get used to those two different ways. They're OK. We can all live together because yeah. we're all making games. Isn't it kind of cool? Yeah. And it's, you know, you can go well, do it. I mean, but beyond, I mean, beyond like a sense of snobbery, I think there is reason to have genuine concern as games take a larger and larger place in our culture. Um, you know, that's, that's why we want to have these conversations right now, because there's sort of an opportunity to really shape what we're thinking about as an industry and sort of talk about these issues before they sort of spiral out of any sense of control, I think, like when, um, when you look at television, you know, and... Um, but isn't that what art is? Art is about spiraling out of control. Like, I don't, I don't want my art in control. I want it out of control. Well, <laughs> but then we can still have a a conversation around what sort of um, artistic responsibility. If it, you know, if it's if if it is art, then there's artistic responsibility that goes along with that. As makers, you know, just as though, you know, if you uh, want to own a restaurant, you know, you can choose to create a restaurant that um, uses local food and has all these great processes, or you can choose to own a McDonald's. And there's like there are things that are problematic about McDonald's food and the way that they <laughs> add additives and sugar to, to you know, have greater desire that's sort of not good for you. Uh, yeah, but um, I don't, I don't so think like, ideas are trans fats. I, I, just think <laughs> I think they absolutely are. I, mean, <laughs> I don't think, like, I I think we've genius. missed this conversation. And I think television is a great example of this, where we have, yes, regulations that prevent cursing and from nudity, but you still have the Jersey Shore, you know, doing what they do. Because we're not talking about that actual impact of that on our children, on us, on what it means for American culture or the global culture. Well, but I, think, I think it's fascinating, actually, to see those things that are a little maybe out of our comfort zone or out of control. I agree with you. You should, you should make the art that expresses who you are and, and the message you want to express. You're reminding me of this game a few years ago. I think it was in the Indie Games Festival. It was, it was a, um, a knockoff of Grand Theft Auto, but it was done as a game about vegetarianism, which is okay. freaking amazing. Um, so try to track that one down. Yeah, um, it's, it was um, Steer Madness, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Steer oh, Madness. Yeah. You were a cow <laughs> that was trying to you know, release all of your cow you know, brethren and, <laughs> and, was, and do all this stuff. Awesome. But I think the, the things that are most interesting to me right now and have been for a few years are the things that I, that I don't expect. And I'll, I'll cross over into danger territory by telling you about one of them. Because it's like three or four years ago, there was a, a bunch of news in the newspapers about how horrible it was that somebody had created a game that was all about shooting our troops in Iraq. And my first thought was, who made that? And I want to see that. And what is all that about? And so I tracked this guy down. And the first thing he told me is, that was a demo. I pitched it to a publisher. They ripped it off. They shipped it before it was done. I was like, boy, that sounds really familiar. I was like, I've heard the same story from game developers time and time again. Um, so I felt a kinship with him there. But then he, what he said to me was, look, I'm just trying to express what I feel and what the people around me feel. And that's what this is about. I'm making a game that's my art expression. So you know, mm -hmm. nobody should have a problem with this because that's mm -hmm. what you're doing. And I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think it's fine if you want to, if you yourself want to say, this is my, these are my limits. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is what I'm not. It, it, that's great. I mean, and I think we all do that. Like we all do that, and we have different standards for that. You have a set of standards. You have a set of standards. I have a set of standards. Mm -hmm. But as soon as somebody else comes in, and starts saying that, that's when I get very, very nervous. Um, like who? Anybody. <laughs> it's nobody. I, it is nobody's business in the universe. They can they can not buy it. That's totally fine. Right. But it's nobody's business what I want to how I want to express myself as this long as I'm not hurting right. anybody. This is what we're talking well, about. I mean, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I, we should be able to have a dialogue about it, right? Absolutely. Without dismissing it as snobbery or judgmental. Like that's I think that's what's important about the exhibit. You know, in this kind of dialogue. See, but that's, that's, that's the point of this, right? It's that it is very easy because the medium is so nascent, because we've only lived with this for a period of 40 years, because when we released, when we created computers, when we created gameplay with computers, we did something that is against human nature, is we told people it was okay to play alone. 
We told people it's okay to be solitary. It's okay to use a computer as a surrogate for human interaction. When it goes against the very nature of what it means to be human. We want to communicate, we want to discover, we want to understand each other, we want to find conflict, we want to find teams. We use game play as a way to discover more about our world. Once we opened up the platform for connection, for global connection, it made it easy for people to do this. There's no wonder in my mind whatsoever as to why people are playing so many games online, why the average, you know, the largest segment of online gamers in America are women over the age of 35, right? It, it has fundamentally changed um, the, the way we're able to go ahead and use this medium to, have, to show every point of view, to allow art in all of its forms to flourish. The problem we have is that it is so easy to dismiss it on its face, on the surface, for what we believe it to be, because it's been dismiss, dismissed its entire progression. I think we're at the point now, for the first time, in the history of the games industry, in the history of technology, in the history of humanity, we have the first children who grew up playing these, who understood there was more to the medium, more to the story, raising children of their own. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think it is absolutely tremendous that we're standing right at the precipice of this, because the art that is going to come out of that movement, the art that's going to happen over the next 10 years, is going to be staggering, right? The, the, social, the social messages, the things that we want to impart upon society, is just going to absolutely blossom moving forward. So it seems like we've just kind of been building up all this time to the jumping off point now. It's weird that you say that games could be isolating. Because you, you could not find a person more isolated than me when I was in sixth or seventh grade. I had no friends, I had no connections, I was lonely, I was weird. And games were my companion, my Atari was my companion, right? And then, and D&D, &D, which at the time, Dungeons and Dragons, which at the time, people probably don't remember, that was one of those things that was corrupting our children. That, you know, <laughs> if, you don't, if you were there, you remember, it was, I mean, no joke, it was a serious, people a serious conversation, it was a TV movie with Tom Hanks, Mm -hmm. where, where somebody um, like got involved yeah. with, they got involved with this D&D &D group and then, oh my God, what happened? And he ends up dead and drugs yeah. or whatever. <laughs> like, seriously. Yeah. And it was this, yeah. done, and when I found, I met, a, I heard of two people over talking on the bus in the ninth grade about Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And I started talking to them. And one of those guys, and then I had, for the first time really in my childhood, had it, th then I found my friends. I found a group of friends. And I'm still friends with this guy to this day. And it absolutely was, it did not shut my world down, it opened my world up. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm forever grateful. And those ideas were dangerous and they were strange and they were weird and they were all I had. And um, so I'm forever grateful to games for sure. that. No, and I didn't say it was a problem that we did no, 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 it, no, right? No, is no. that, <laughs> yeah, we all did it. That's a perception. Right, yeah, and that was, you know, that's the problem, it's the perception. I mean, my mother would always tell me, why are you doing this, go outside and get some air? And I, all right, I got some there. Let, let me go back and, and type. Yeah. Get the extension on, on cord. The on the drive exactly. in here. We've done that. I'm sorry. We actually took a black and white television and the VIG-20 out into the backyard with an extension cord <laughs> and actually were out there playing some terrible, I think it was, I can't even remember the name of it right the, now. The, Radar the, Rat Race. Radar Rat Race. The, the cab driver driving me in uh, asked me where I was going. I said, I'm going to the art video games. And do you do, you, do, you, do, you do anything with video games? Well, not really, I, but <laughs> sort of. <laughs> and he then said, can I, I, I need your advice. I said, what's that? He said, I, I, how can I stop my child playing computer games? Oh, man. Mm. And I was like, oh, I'm not, not sure I'm the right person. <laughs> 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 he, was, he was like, he, 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 he obsessively plays them all the time, you know. I said, oh, OK, oh, that's, that's interesting. And he, he said, it's, it's not good for him. I said, oh. I said, I said, oddly enough, my mother had a very similar um, attitude to me when I, I was up in my bedroom constantly playing on my computer. And she was always going, go outside, get some exercise, get some sun, yeah. go out and play with other people. And, and, and all those people who were outside, if I went outside, would beat me up and, and, and right. be mean to me. And um, now, of course, when I go home and I'm driving past, they're there holding up stop signs and waving me through and <laughs> digging up roads. Great suntans. And so I sort of, I'm sort of from the other side, which is, no, you should play more games. <laughs> <laughs> which everyone is. So that's, that's a good right. point. You know, to the point of playing more games, we talk about the golden age, I'd love to... Not that you can stop me. I'm going to share this story with you, which, which had this juxtaposition um, that struck me and my wife as we were sitting to discuss this as just the, the craziest, bizarre thing. When the Wii was released and you know, we looked at um, how 
controls and, and new types of gameplay, which are old types of gameplay, ping yeah. pong, tennis, these sorts of things, kind mm -hmm. of opened up the door to uh, acceptance right, of games of a different generation. My parents, uh, my, my father and my stepmother, they had wanted a Wii for Christmas. They, they couldn't get one. They bought one at like a silent auction for I think $600 because they wanted one so desperately. <laughs> and then they asked me for games for Christmas. Mm -hmm. So my parents, parents were asking me <laughs> to get them awesome. games for Christmas. Now, it gets better. Um, <laughs> one night, we had gotten you know, our kids' homework done and got them all to bed. And it's like, oh, we're exhausted. Let's watch a little TV and sit down. It must have been 10, 30 at night or so. The phone rings. And it's my stepmother. And there's all this noise in the background. And she says, we're having trouble getting these two controllers connected to the Wii. What, what do we need to do? And I'm going, what the hell are you doing? It's like Wednesday night at 10.30. And she goes, no, no, we're trying to play. I said, like, all right, what, what game is it? My wife's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I don't know. Just come, come down. And I'm like, oh, no, that's not a four play again. That's too big. OK, we got to go. We got to go. It's my turn. Bye. And she hangs the phone. I'm like, <laughs> Seriously, I'm like, like, what get outside that? and get some air. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, listen, before we open this up to some Q&A, what I really want to talk about is, you know, I, I'd like us, you all, I've spoken enough, to take yourselves a little bit outside of the type of games you do. And if you could, we'll start with Kelly. Tell me some things that you would hope for the future of games, right? What video games could achieve in the world? Something that sits maybe apart from where you think we are today. You know, what would be kind of your biggest hopes for where you think games could go? Uh, well, I mean, I'm kind of borrowing from what Mark said at the beginning, which is that my biggest hope is that the, the people who are making games and what those people look like um, completely changes. I think that's where we're going to see new types of stories and new types of experiences. And yeah, I mean, I think with the, the more accessible technology and distribution channels, that's what's really exploded in, in just the last five years and has impacted it so much. The stories around the, the, the types of people who are finding success, you know, however uh, rare or, um, or huge they may be on the App Store, it has sort of, I think, flipped a switch for a lot of people of saying, like, oh, well, I could do that too, you know, and it's at least opened them up to the possibility of thinking about making games themselves and telling their own stories. And I think that's. That's what I'm excited for. Great. Ken? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what, what's, what's interesting about, about games is, is what is those surprises we get. And, and I think they're becoming much more democratized, like you're saying, with the App Store and things like Kickstarter, in terms of people feeling it's not something that a bunch of guys in suits decide. It's a bunch of things. It's the things that we decide, that individuals decide. And certainly, when I was yeah. coming up, and I'm sure when, when, when most guys were coming up, it was it was already sort of like you know like the record industry. It, it, it was you know formed, and there were people who had the funding. And as the requirement for funding goes down, for external funding goes down, I think the creativity is naturally going to go up. But I I also think that there's going to be cycles, like the Kickstarter thing. Probably there's going to be some giant thing that explodes and causes a problem there, and then there's going to be some weird hybrid model with some funding coming in, or and and you're going to have venture capital people getting interested in because it's just create excitement in this space. And not, so the future is not really clear, but I think the, the fluidity of the funding model is, is, is going to be the most exciting driver for you know, as you bringing new people in and different kinds of people in, and also for just for the creative process, because you don't need to convince a marketing person that this is going to be a successful idea. I mean, you know, Minecraft's a great example. If you had to try to convince a marketing guy of that, <laughs> that probably wouldn't be a really hard sell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, what do I think? <laughs> Tell us. <coughs> I, I think that uh, it's going to be easier to, I think it's easier right now to become a computer game maker. What you should do is get hold of anything, anything, and no matter what anyone says, make something, no matter how good it is, and put it out. No matter if anyone buys it, it doesn't matter, because then you're a game maker. Mm -hmm. From then on, the only thing you have to worry about is budget, scope, and ideas. Because you've already done it. <laughs> so it's just, that's, that's all you have to play with uh, at, that, at that point. So I think, I think that's really, really, really exciting. And, and I'm really, really impressed with um, when I started, there was no way of going to school to learn how to do this. Then there were some courses that started up that were terrible. Um, and now there are some courses that are actually uh, astonishing. Uh, I've, I've been blessed to go to lots of different universities and see them. Ones where they run like actual little studios. 
and they have their own little budgets and that, and they're making games, they're doing stuff, and there's a digging rig was one I just played recently. Um, so there's a whole new wave of people coming out. They're fearless. They, they expect success. They, they have wide-ranging views. They're not built in the same sort of grounds that I came from, and they want to make games. They don't want to make games that are art. They want to make games that are awesome. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the place I like being in. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make art, I want to make awesome. And so I'm very, very happy about the future. Before you go, typically, m more times than not, an artist doesn't get to choose whether or not their work becomes art. So while you want to go ahead, you can say that I'm an artist, I can say that every time I you know, put a brush to canvas, what I'm creating is art that will be held up or will aspire to be labeled as art. I, you can make, we can all make the actual accurate argument that if anything comes out of expression, it's art. Right? It's, right. It's, it's art. Um, when we're talking about in the context of it being recognized by a broader segment of the population as art, it's interesting that while I agree that games need to be awesome first because terrible games are terrible games regardless of how beautiful they are, regardless of what the message is. If you can't connect with the player in some meaningful way, if the, if the mechanics don't work, if there's frustration that, that it removes them from what it is you're trying to say, then it falls apart. So I agree 100% that games should be awesome. But I think it's also important to recognize that where the next great games that are viewed as art, artful, um, are not necessarily the ones that we can discern. They're not ones that we really have a say in, right? One can argue that Minecraft is an extraordinarily beautiful game, you know, much more artistic, much more, you know, held up more as art than so many more photorealistic games or games that really push, you know, massive amounts of space because within it you have imbued the, kind of the desire and the creativity of the player themselves and it's, you're kind of self-reflecting that. So I just want to make the point that I, while I agree 100%, games have to be awesome first and foremost, where art's going to come from is anywhere, right? And we, we can't predict that. So trying to go ahead and uh, make the case that you're not trying to create art may not be entirely in your control. They may deem what you think is just awesome as art. The, the more that gamers get old, and then they have money, and then they want to invest in museums, and they want to invest <laughs> stuff, and, 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 and they want to run for president because they were gamers, uh, the, more, the more they will legitimize it, that's great. And the thing they'll talk about will be awesome games that they now say are art, and I'm all for that. All right, that I accept. <laughs> <laughs> accept that. Awesome art. Awesome art. Mark. Um, no, I forget what the original question was, but I'll just react. <laughs> the the original do. question was, what is your hope for the future of video games? Where do you think uh, they can actually go? What can they teach us? Yeah, well, I, I guess I vented about that a little bit earlier, but being a technologist, I feel it's incumbent upon me to represent my, my peoples, uh, <laughs> the engineers. And you know, I think it's been, it's been fascinating to me this day because we got to hear about um, you know, the guys who brought us in television. And, a uh, gentleman who bought us pitfalls down right down here at the front row. That's right, Mr. David Crane, right down here. Which is fantastic, and I <laughs> spent a lot of time on. Um, and Rand, Rand, Rand and Robin Miller are over here, and I, I still remember the, the uh, opening chime to Mist. It just it plays in my dreams, to your point about game, game tracks. <laughs> um, and I think about all of the constraints that they all faced as they were making games, and I think it's easy especially as a technologist, as we go forward from platform to platform to platform, we get more memory and more CPU and more resolution and more channels of audio to think, wow, we can do anything we want. But then, and then I think about, I think about, I'm going to come back to you again, Kelly, because I think about the way I felt when I played Flower for the first time. And the way I felt was I would never have made this game because the constraints that I grew up inside of this was not something that I just uh, that I would conceive of. The tools mm -hmm. that I had, the power horsepower I had, I was trying to replicate other things that I'd seen and gone through. And so, what gives me great hope is thinking that for me, looking back, you know, when I got my start and the constraints that were there, the people who are looking at the platforms we have now and thinking that they're constrained on these platforms, what are they going to be doing in 15, 20 years? Like, this is what I get excited about. I want to see when, you know. The constraints of today seem like I'm some primitive guy. You know, I've got handcuffs. I can't even make a character articulate properly on screen. Uh, what are you going to do when you've got 10x the horsepower and, and five channels of 
video around you in 360 degrees. You know, I, I don't know what it's going to be like, but I hope it's a lot more immersive and I hope there's a lot more educational content because that would sure be nice. Yeah. That would sure be nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, guys. All right, so now we're going to open up to questions from the audience. If you could say your name and then ask your question, and you were waiting in line last time, so you get to go first. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael, and I've got a question about, like, what do you guys think of, like, really pretentious indie games? Like, I follow the indie game. I follow independent games a lot, and, like, it used to be that for every, like, you know, legitimately good indie game you get, like, oh, I don't know, Cave Story or Bastion or something, you get a dozen games that are just, like, you know, a, plat a very minimalist platformer with a disembodied voice reading poetry or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, whenever I play one of those games, I'm imagining, like, um, What's his name? That soup can guy. Um, <laughs> Warhol. Andy Warhol. Yes, Andy Warhol. Like <laughs> talking to a camera <laughs> about like how it's his artistic vision and that it represents a zip case or something stupid like that. Uh -huh. So, what do you have to say to people who make really pretentious indie games? I, well, I would say I would say to you, just don't buy those games. I mean, they're like usually flash games and stuff. Wait, don't don't play okay, those games. On. I mean, it's, yeah. it's as a creative medium, as an artistic medium, it should support a wide variety of experiences. And you know, not everyone has to play my games, and I don't think anyone here thinks everyone has to like our games. So, look, the, the, the broader range of expression <laughs> out there, the better, I think. You know, yeah. look, you read an interview with somebody and it may annoy you, but you know, don't read that interview. I think I I think is is the thing, but. Out of a lot of out of that game you're talking about, with you know, with the disembodied voice, somebody's going to come along and make some awesome first-person shooter, taking an idea out of that that you're going to love. But they're going to steal an idea out of that, and they're going to turn it into something that maybe is more to your taste. And I, you know, I steal ideas from everywhere I see, from really strange things you would never expect. And I think that's the value, even to a guy like you, is is you're, there's going to be an idea that you're going to love someday that you're going to have no idea comes from some guy living in his mom's basement, you know, writing poetry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Nick from Princeton again. So, um, I have to say, Kelly, you are my hero, because you talked about trans fat. I was a major uh, nutrition in college, and I know it seems a little irrelevant, but it is totally relevant, because I know what you were talking about before, about uh, responsibility as game developers and what it impacts on society. And I think that's what you were getting about, about food and about how it inter interacts with society. And I think regardless of the medium, whether it's video games, food, movie, uh, the person that's creating that has the responsibility to do whatever they want. But within that, they have to realize the impact that they're doing and the audience that they're addressing. So I, I love that you stood up for the trans fat but at the same time, I, I kind of have a question, you know, what do you think about this censorship? I mean, look at ESRB, and then you've got right. SOPA and PIPA that, like, try to charge in and take away that sort of creativity. So I think, mm -hmm. uh, just personally, if, if ask yourself and, and uh, tell us back, uh, what do you think <laughs> about uh, the restriction on that kind of creative, you know, juices that flow? Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is with the grain of salt that I've not been involved in any of those, you know, organizations or understand the kind of work that they do or the thinking that goes into it. But, but I personally feel like a better leverage of that energy and those dollars spent is into um, supporting works that we think are interesting or valuable or, you know, ones that we want to, the kinds that we want to see more of as opposed to... Um, punishing people that, uh, whose, whose works we don't necessarily agree with. But yeah, I mean, Ken said it well, is that it's kind of, there's an element that, has, that does have to be out of control. Like, I don't, I don't think it should be restricted. I think what should be ultimately supported is, is exactly what's you know, happening here at the Smithsonian, is that we have a dialogue about it. I think that's really the most important thing, that as long as we're talking about it, as long as we're empowering families to talk with one another about it, you know, um, that's, that's what's really important. I think your point is great, because like, the problems breed in the shadows, you know, where, where, exactly. where there's no sunlight. And when people don't understand, and when they don't really know 
what they're talking about. Like very rarely do you hear somebody who's truly informed about games, uh, you know, talking in apocalyptic terms about them. It's usually mm -hmm. people who have no idea what they're talking about. And you can go through the the transcript of, um, of Schwarzenegger versus. Um, um, was it ESA versus Schwarzenegger? Um, mm -hmm. And you see some really mis misinformed understanding of how games work in that opinion, written by the highest court in the land. And um, and that's that's a little. And listen, I'm, I'm thrilled that the re the decision was what it was. But it was kind of, if you really read into it, it was kind of a near thing. Mm -hmm. And um, and most of it is because those people have no understanding of of of, of the media. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, to the point we were discussing before, it's. Time will solve that problem, right? Yes. As, as those of us that grew up with this, that understand it, that continue to impart that to younger generations, and they grow up and they understand it. It's like any other form of media that's come before. It's like any other form of art that has broken through traditional art boundaries, right? This is a medium whose time is starting right now. Is yeah. one that you know we're going to continue to move forward. With. Well, time and through a lot of hard work and doing. I mean, I mean, really, like stuff like this that says, you know, that's not. This isn't just this thing your kids do in the basement, like. We need to be talking about this and, and what it means and what we want to see out of that. Agreed. <laughs> I know. Thanks for the question. Over here, please. Yeah, um, my question was um, uh, the. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Russell. And uh, my uh, question what is based on uh, actually something that was talked about in both panels um, arcade games. Uh, I'm sure uh, you can agree that even just the cabinets of those arcade games have artistic value. And uh, I miss the arcades. They, they seem to be dying, almost dead at this point. And they, for me, they were a huge uh, part of my, uh, my childhood socially. And uh, I was wondering what your opinions on the traditional arcade versus today's arcade with PSN, XBLA, and the virtual console are. Who misses arcades? <laughs> What's the greatest arcade game ever made? It's Robotron. not an opinion, it's Robotron 2084. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, quite honestly, you know, during the era of the, really the, the golden era of arcades, mm -hmm. right, is um, it's the same sort of issues that I think the earliest game systems had, which is the technology wasn't, um, wasn't advanced enough or sufficient enough to fully describe you know, what the gameplay was supposed to be, what the story was supposed to be. And so the cabinet, the side art, the, the marquee, all of these things kind of brought together a bigger world view, a bigger, uh, painted a larger scope of what you were engaging in. You, know, you look at the side art cabinet for Space Invaders, I mean, the giant monster never even appears yeah. in the game, but it was trying to inform what it is that you were kind of faced when all of a sudden you saw these very rudimentary squid-like figures <laughs> you know, moving down this, the, the screen. And so I think it's just as we are able to more fully express the worlds we want to create, the stories we want to tell, some of that kind of falls away because they're now inside the game as opposed to sitting as materials outside the game. That's one perspective. Yeah, I Anybody? mean, another I think permutation of it is how um, is connected play and the increase uh, in experiences we can use on our mobile phone to connect with one another in real in the real world as well. Um, things like highlight that's just coming out uh, to connect with other people because I think that that was a really important part of it is like the physical community aspect of it, um, the opportunity to meet other people who yeah. are like you. Yeah. Unfortunately, the death of arcades in America occurred with the death of roller rinks in America. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real travesty. That is the real travesty. Yeah, yeah. For me, um, I think that the, the arcade phenomenon, a lot of it was a social aspect that made it popular. For me, I could care less about talking to other people when I went to an arcade, I have to admit. <laughs> it was all about the games. Um, and um, I, I think conventional wisdom among, among folks that I've talked to is that one of the main reasons the arcades went away is that they didn't provide a unique experience as compared to the home consoles. Um, and you can kind of see now, if you go to somewhere like Dave & Buster's or somewhere like this, they're still trying to differentiate themselves by having um, you know, stereo head-mounted displays or things that you can pneumatic engage system. with, yeah, pneumatic things, like, like the boxing thing or whatever. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't 
see the arcades really coming back. It's, it was a time that was exciting and happy to have been there, but it lasted longer in Japan than here, certainly. So if you go to Japan, there's still a few around. Um, but I want to put a, a plug for, a, for one thing. If you haven't heard of the Arcade Ambiance website, um, if, you're, if you love the arcades and you, you want to get taken back to, your, to the game track of your life, um, somebody has gone through and used MAME played a whole bunch of games from different periods, so from 81, from 85, from 92, recorded all the audio, mixed it spatially, and then just and then put it out as MP3, so <laughs> it's pretty yeah, cool. And, yeah, and, <laughs> Go and to that website. those tracks are literally two to three hours long. Yeah. So it is just, just a loop of arcade, and you can, you can sit there and go, oh, I know exactly what Whoa. that is. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> time pilot. That's right. Robotron. If you listen to all two hours in a row, then you need to go talk to them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or Thank you're you. a programmer. Thank you for the question. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, Daniel Wallace. I'm a human factors engineer, and so I'd like to talk to the technologist here a little bit about the future of, <laughs> of the technology side especially with respect to how we can exploit some of the sensory perceptual oh, capabilities yeah. and limitations of people without having a whole lot of expensive um, apparatus. That is, um, where, where do you see that, that going without uh, you know, huge you know, multi-million dollar immersive environments? You know, if, you're, if you're a human factors guy, you've probably seen a lot of the same stuff I have. I, mean, I came out of virtual reality research in the late 80s, early 90s. and. Um, I love stereo head-mounted displays, but at the time, they weighed about 25 pounds, and putting two CRTs in front of your eyeballs seems like a bad idea, so they were hard <laughs> to get popular. Um, however, at the time, one of the things that the, the team I was working with was really working on was, this, was putting a micro laser, again, it sounds like a bad idea, um, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the hinge points of your glasses, but a micro laser that was so low wattage that you know, it, could, it could draw an image mm -hmm. over your visual environment. And, and not harm you. Um, and the, the early really hot. <laughs> yeah. why, why am I sweating so much? <laughs> Who's cooking bacon? <laughs> but I, I think that the, like that technology has slowly proceeded forward. You see the little Pico projectors now is maybe one example of that. Um, but I think it it highlights what has to happen to some technologies before they really gain um, a wide use. I really want to see immersivity come to games where I can turn my head and not lose the scene. You know, it's like Connect is a half step towards that. Now it knows that I turned my head, but if it adjusts the scene, I can't tell because I'm not looking at the TV anymore. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, so I'm hoping we'll get to a point, there's rumors about these goggles from, or glasses from Google that I think could be an interesting step toward where we're going with that. Anyway, so, that, so a stereo head-mounted display I think would be fascinating. You do see, uh, the price of all kinds of sensors coming down, as I'm sure you know. You know, I've, I've got a little Fitbit in my pocket. It just it tracks how many steps I walk. And these micro accelerometers, I think, can be used for a lot. But if you require a player to put on a wristband before they play their game, that might be a barrier to entry. You know, the, the Wii was successful in using accelerometers, but it uses the same sort of controller modality we were all familiar with. So we pick it up, and, and that works great. The Kinect works great because it looks at you. So you don't have to wear sensors. And I think the next, the immediate next generation of machines are probably going to incorporate more of that technology than uh, a worn sensor technology. But I hope that we get to the point where there's some middle ground or you can improve the fidelity of your experience if you're willing to put on a sensor-laden suit or something. Thanks for asking. Over here. Do you see this going further, more more pervading everyday life outside of our strict entertainment time? So you're talking about gamification, I think, right? <laughs> so here is my street pass on <laughs> CBS. <laughs> and if I go back to the plaza, I have 10 more people that I just collected <laughs> in the room, so thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think there are ways that, are, that are, it's possible to go ahead and bring very meaningful gameplay to our life. I mean, 
we use game theory, we use the discussion of game mechanics components and everything from business to military to sports. Um, so it's interesting how you appropriate it. The, the important thing is to make sure that we don't abuse it, that we make sure that we are not overburdening society, we're not overburdening ourselves with constantly trying to uh, game the system for you know, just arbitrary or irrelevant benefit. I don't know how many people Foursquare, I don't because I'm like, I'm not going to punch into this machine every single time, every time I'm jumping in. Well, first of all, it's like, okay, hey, I just landed in Spain. Oh, you means your house is empty? <laughs> That's great, right? I mean, so, right, so, so we have to be very careful, I think, and cognizant of what it is we do. I think there's an appropriate way to use them to uh, great social benefit, but like with anything else, we just have to temper the desire to gamify everything with you know, what I think is probably responsible. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think great games um, utilize a similar, a similar underlying understanding of human psychology and anthropology. And so what just bothers me in sort of the gamification, and that's a great example with that, is like literally taking a game mechanic that is in another game and applying it to something in the real world, as opposed to approaching it from a perspective of, OK, we want um, you know, I want my team to be more engaged on a day-to-day -day and weekly pro you know, process. So how can we apply the design, you know, good design of engaging systems to help them in that process, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's a, you have to be delicate about what you gamify. I think for me, the one that pops is like, you absolutely should gamify is education. It's just because my, my experience <laughs> of learning math as a third grader, my third grade teacher, you know, got me to a certain point, and then she started giving me these workbooks that were just puzzles of crazy math problems. And I'd fill out the crazy math problem, and give me a letter, I'd put it in a, in a phrase, and eventually I'd get the whole phrase, and you know, I guess I win. Um, I, I think you can really, like, there are, I don't want to say all students are going to be motivated by this, but I think a lot of students could be motivated by game-like ideas, and we should totally exploit that. But at the same time, I think there are limits to that as well, yeah. because, um, I think it's bad to teach kids that everything should be fun and easily and like immediately gratifying because sometimes <laughs> problems are hard and sometimes you need to learn something and it's kind of boring and you, like, <laughs> you have to, that's a skill yeah. as well. So. Sure. Well, I have plenty of boring experiences too, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. to, to your point though, you know, one of the things I was not very good at doing when I was a kid was math and I had a very difficult time doing it because I tend to be a very visual person. But when I had to do math to create a grid within a game or to create <laughs> right. a character generator or do something like that, I could do it very easily. And so because, to, uh, the, uh, to your point, there was pleasure in overcoming the problem that was greater than just right. overcoming the problem itself. And so I think there is a very real important notion in entertainment to help people understand how to adopt, how to adapt, how mm -hmm. to get past some very... Uh, you know, difficult barriers, right? So, isn't yeah. that just interest and engagement, though? It's just right. nothing to do with gaming. No, 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 it doesn't. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just thing. I think it. Yeah, it's again, it's things we've learned by making games yeah. to create engaging experiences. That, yeah, I think other people in other fields should absolutely yeah. know. My, and my, da my dad can't remember anything, but you ask him anything about Manchester United Football Club of any <laughs> year of any game and he has statistics coming out of his brain. <laughs> he doesn't know where his car keys are. <laughs> and it's because he's engaged and entertained. I mean, I think, I think there's a pernicious and crazy darkness about gamification or anything. It's some sort of madness that you shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. Mobile phones are changing the world. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. Isn't it? People, just get, people get all confused about it. Get people engaged and happy, they learn stuff. Amazement. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> happening for years. Right. Well, <laughs> Be happy. That's great. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Next question. Uh, my name is Sam. Uh, uh, what do you think of the whole idea where you know community has influence on making a game story, mm. like for Paul with Bioware? Because I guess of the current fiasco going on right now. You have a yeah, fiasco? I brought it up <coughs> with the uh, Mass Effect endings. If computer games are art, then I fully endorse the author of the artwork to have a statement about what they believe should happen. Just as J.K. Rowling can end her books and say that's the end of Harry Potter, I don't think well, she no, should be <coughs> enforced to make another one. <laughs> 
love those games, and I love Bioshock, so. <laughs> <laughs> you look quite shocked. You're okay. You're right. you, you know, I, I want to speak to this as well because I think it's an important moment. I think not only do I believe in the authorial intent of 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 of, of you know Bioware in this situation, and I'm I think when if those people got what they wanted, and they wrote their ending, they would be very disappointed in the feeling the the emotional feeling they got because then it's just. You know, there's just then it's not they didn't really create it, and, and it's not something that's being communicated to them. It becomes it's like when people want to go see like, oh, I'd love to see Mick Jagger and Paul McCartney and um, you know Ringo Starr and Jimmy Page play Hey Jude, mm -hmm. and then you go there and actually it's not that good because it, 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 you're, it's something new, it's something exciting, it's not challenging you. And I think that I think that it's in that whole this whole thing is making me a little bit sad because I don't think anybody would get what they wanted if that happened. Great point. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, my name's Brandon, and I admit to taking the TV outside, gathering the neighborhood kids, <laughs> and playing Super Smash Bros. with Baylor. All right, slow <laughs> clap. There we go. <laughs> and winning every single game while I'm at it. Right. <laughs> um, my question deals with just the beginning of the game design process. You have an idea, and you're trying to build your team. My question is about communication. What are you looking for in the people that you're working with, and how in the world do you convey to them this game that's in your head? Well, first of all, it's generally not in your in your head. It's you know, it's if you're not the purpose of a team is to build up a, a group of people who are contributing. And I think that's really important because if you don't, if you think it's all gonna come out of one, like one game developer I knew, who I shall not name, one said that um, he wished he had a machine that could transfer his ideas into an actual game. And, and that was kind of sad to me because my favorite part of making games is working with the people I work with. And, you know, and the, my favorite part is when they come up with stuff so I don't have to because, <laughs> You know, you come into work and that thing's there, and you're like, oh, that's great, I'm yeah, going to go home. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the worst thing is being responsible. The more you're responsible for it, I think the, 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 the worse, in some degree, it is, and the harder it is. So, but I think to your point, communication, I think, especially like, you know, a Bioshock Infinite team has grown and is about 100 and something people now, and frankly, it is the biggest problem, no, without a doubt, that people do not know what's going on in the game because just figuring out what to communicate and when to communicate it, because we could send everybody home every night with a transcript of every meeting that we had and force everybody to read it, but then the game's never getting done. Mm -hmm. So you, it's really, I think our, one of our biggest challenges on the management side is figuring out what and when, what to communicate and when to communicate and how to communicate it. And it's gonna be very, it, it is by far, by far our largest problem. Yeah, I mean, if I could say it, I wouldn't have to make a game about it. So I did say, don't be too frustrated with the, the with, you know, an inability to clearly communicate, but just in our process, it's sort of a, an ongoing and continual process of having dialogue, creating sentences and phrases, and also beats of movies or a piece of music, yeah. you know, when you're like, oh, this song, this is how I want it to feel, you know, that can be really good. Um, a good way to get everyone on the same page. And then, you know, really game making is an, what I love about it is that it's a process of discovery. So we're play testing once a week or at least every two weeks, very beginning um, until the end. So really trying out an idea and playing it and getting feedback and it's totally brutal and emotional and you're like, oh God, everything's gonna be terrible. But, you know, just being okay with that and folding that into your process. Uh, I've got two, two bits of advice, one from Karl Marx and one from Monty Python. <laughs> um, Karl Marx wrote a lot of twaddle, but one of the things he wrote that wasn't too bad was about alienation mm. and people who build things in isolation and don't know why it connects and how it connects end up building things that are terrible. So try and prevent alienation. Uh, let someone understand why they're making that bucket and why it's so incredibly vital. Mm -hmm. uh, so that they make a really good bucket. And mm -hmm. then you go, it's a, it's a killer bucket. It goes on people's heads <laughs> so I can steal things. Very important bucket. Uh, so alienation, try and prevent that through communication. And then on Monty Python, uh, Graham Chapman and John Cleese work together a lot. 
And uh, they often said their best ideas were often um, a bad idea, uh, misheard, and mm. then told to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> so so I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have too much communication, maybe muffle. That's probably the best idea. But, but that's how good ideas happen. They happen by sharpening your blades on each other. I'll, 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 I'll come at that from the other direction. Just to be argumentative, which is, I think there's something really delicious about a single voice and a, uh, there's a purity of communication that can come from one person who's really trying to get a message across. I think it's getting harder and harder in games to do that because it's getting more and more challenging to, to be the master of all those different uh, domains. But uh, I think it's something like Braid maybe is an example that's close to that. I know John Blow had lots of friends, lots of communications, but man, he was, he was really busting butt on that game for three years largely by himself. And I mean, it really comes out. That, that is him in a box when you, when you play that game. There's something lovely about that. Great, thank you for the question. Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Lawrence, and uh, I've got a simple question for the panel um, for the future. How many years before games overtake Hollywood? <laughs> in what way? In what sense, yeah. <laughs> in terms of just pure entertainment value, because you see with productions, with games, I mean, they rival, you know, Hollywood productions. And it just seems that right now, as it stands, people are paying 20, 20 bucks to go see an IMAX movie, when I can go play $60, and I can get 20 to 40 hours as opposed to two to three. Don't say that too loud, or the movie theaters are gonna start wanting to charge you 60 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, why do you care? I mean, I, did, I mean, quite legit, legitimately. I mean, I don't ask it to be facetious. It's like, you know, it's like asking when are we going to have more box office than car sales? So like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. uh, cars are cars. Games are awesome. They're great. They're fabulous. They're everywhere. I love them. Everyone I talk to plays them. They're ace. They're more important <laughs> to me than movies. I don't care about Hollywood's box office. I mean, I'm just interested in like, just, just literally why, why you is it. Is it going past Best Buy and going, there's too many computer games? Not enough computer games. <laughs> it's like, no, is it because we don't have adverts on TV? We have adverts on TV. It's like, I'm not sure why, why it should worry you. I mean, in volume and money, we're probably close. In, in closeness to people's hearts and, 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 and how much people care about it, we're probably close, if not by. If, if you're talking about penetration into the market space, I'd say we were further along than they were. So I sort of, but probably cocaine use, we're probably way down on that. <laughs> uh, and and, and pro probably getting, getting, having movie stars, like we don't have computer game stars. We're the, so we're not on the National Enquirer pages mm -hmm. and we don't have the gossip rags, but I sort of go, I, I genuinely, I genuinely don't care. Um, and I think. Do you care? I think maybe oh, to bring no. it back no, around care. to probably what you're asking is, and, and what Paul has put a stake in the ground for is that um, that it's not as if we have to say when does painting replace written word, when does you know music replace any other form of artistic expression. Well, we should all be just absolutely pleased with is the fact that we live in a time where we have access to more forms of communication for more forms of expression than at any other point in human existence. So it's not about saying, well, I'm a gamer. Guess what? Everybody's a gamer. And guess what? In one more generation, that's even going to be truer. And so the, you know, what can we say? What is it? Two more election cycles will have a president who grew up solidly within the Nintendo generation, right? Yeah. So, that doesn't mean they're going to necessarily like movies any less. It's a different form of communication. It's a different form. It's, in fact, it's not interactive. It's designed to be you know, imparted to the viewer. So I'd say, and agree with Paul, we're already there. And for so many of us that grew up with this, which is one of the reasons why the exhibition is here, we've always known this to be true. We've always known it to be important. <laughs> and we now have the opportunity to, as Kelly said, have that dialogue from this point forward. And so I'd say let there be movies and games. <laughs> and we're better. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, if for nothing, it's for matching jacket and shoes. I was going to say the style. <laughs> Ooh, okay, I think cute. we have That's time really for questions. possibly one or two more questions. Yes. He's dangerous. The next wired 
Dot com reporter Chris oh, Kohler, watch this yourself. This is the tough one, last one. Hello, hello. Okay. Hello. Well, this microphone is actually taller than me. <laughs> so that must be symbolism for something. Anyways, I've got a quick question. Um, and this exhibit is about video games as an art form. You probably had exhibits as movies as an art form. But, mo okay, no, scratch that. I have a different question. Okay, forget everything I said. I've got a different question now. Okay. Okay. With video games in such a mainstream market today, don't you think that, have you ever seen TV shows today and they're playing Donkey Kong on their Xbox 360 with the controller held upside down with a <laughs> VMU stuck into the, when do you think we'll actually get to the point when you can go up to someone, take a game out of your pocket, put it in their face, and they'll say, oh, this is how you play it, this is what the game called, this is what the company is. When do you think we'll have the mass, not just media, but mass consumer and media emergence, where if you show anyone, tell anyone, hey, uh, Citizen Kane, well. they'll obviously know what that movie is. But if you go up to anyone, like, God, the money, Damacy! They'll just stare at you awkwardly. <laughs> Why isn't he on the panel? I know. <laughs> he asked amazing questions on the last part. You know what? I'm not even going to attempt, so I'll leave it to you. I will remove myself. I mean, I feel like we're, we're kind of there. Like, Angry Birds. Like, who doesn't know? I mean, it's said everywhere that's been, you know, mocked in, in almost every TV show at this point. Like, it's one. Maybe it's one thing, or Farmville. You know, maybe there's there's just the sort of few stars in the sky right now that really show that. But I think that's just it's just showing that's the that's only the beginning. Like that's just the the first crest of the wave that that's coming. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. That's and I think just just recently there have been a couple of things. The Mike was talking about uh, the Jimmy Kimmel stuff earlier, which I think you, if you watch Jimmy Kimmel, you'll see him bring games on there now and then. And every time he does, I'm just like, oh, thank God. Right. Um, and then uh, yeah. amusingly, on The Daily Show a couple of nights ago, he had, for any of you WoW players, they had Leroy Jenkins run across, <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> um, so I, I think we're close. It feels like we're at a turning point. But I don't think, I don't think people will, you'll never be able to pull, I don't know, about Katamari Damashi. I, I wish that would be one they'd recognize, but you know, we're getting <laughs> but there. But going forward, I think it's happening. Yeah. Absolutely. Herman Cain used a Pokemon quote. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, I have Katamar uh, Damasi in my PS Vita sitting down here in my bag. So if you walked up to me and said, Katamar, and I'd go, yes, I know it's awesome. Right, right. <laughs> Thank you for your question again. Yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. <laughs> could repeat the question because I don't know if your audio came through so for the people yeah, that so are watching. Yeah, she, so she was just talking about um, comparing uh, my pretentious game with other pretentious games. <laughs> um, Journey with, uh, with Dear Esther which was recently available for download on Steam and is a game in which you play through this pretty fairly rich 3D environment and you're walking through and there's a narrative that's unfolding and that's kind of it, you're just walking around the space. And in my game Journey, you do a lot of walking around as well as the story unfolds for you. Um, and yeah, I hope, you know, I hope that there are more of all types of games. I mean, that's really, that's really my, my whole goal and my whole thing is that I don't think one type is better than, the, than another. It's just I want to see more variety of experiences so that you know, I can come home and say, like, I'm in the mood for this kind of game and that there is that kind of game there. Sometimes I want to engage in intense combat with my friends online and we'll play Call of Duty. And sometimes I want to just move around a gorgeous environment. And I used to have to um, 
get on Halo 2 with nobody there and just do that and you know move around <laughs> on the online environments. But now you know you have a, an actually uh, a created experience for that, and that's really cool. It's really exciting. There's a game that Rand and Robin did called The Manhole many years ago, which I think is really one of the earliest predecessors of this, this sort of experiential game that's just about sort of poking around. And, and it was obviously it was a long time ago, and mm -hmm. the, the technology was relatively limited, but there was no sort of point to it. I think that was one of the beautiful things about it. It was just an experience of exploring. And I think that's what, you know, Kelly's games do a lot of, and I think, you know, games like Dear Esther do, and I think that's, it's a, it's a great form. Well, thank you. And uh, that was all the time we have for questions. I do apologize. Um, we do have to clear the auditorium now at the end of this panel, but hopefully, uh, you know, our panel's there. So I want to thank our panelists. Definitely come up. Yeah, that's